Hey y'all, it's your good buddy Archie Gamble here, and coming at you from London, Ontario. And for today's uh, Gamble Ramble, I was inspired to speak by another vlog that I watch on YouTube, actually a channel called Rock Feed, and um, it was uh, quoting an interview with uh, Corey Taylor, the great frontman from the band Slipknot, and he was talking about how people may be surprised uh the actual income earned by the members of Slipknot and for the various reasons for that. So he was went on to elaborate that they don't make as much money as people might think. So that got me thinking, you know, this has been a subject I've been meaning to conquer with the Ramble for quite some time, and that is finances in the music industry. So let me start out by saying that I'm probably not the most qualified person in the world to talk about this sort of thing, well, certainly that strata of success, because, you know, I haven't even had a record deal myself in 30 years. Well, I mean, I was in a band called The Joys. We had a record deal, basically a distribution deal with no real money involved. Uh, but the Buffalo Brothers band I was in, in the 90s and early 2000s, we had an actual proper record deal, direct signing to a label with advances and tourist support and video budgets and, you know, radio budgets and so on and so forth. So being a person that took care of most of the business as a liaison with the label, I do have a better than usual understanding. And granted, in the last 30 years, record deals have changed and money has changed. But as someone who enjoys the minutiae of the music business, I've always tried to keep up on things. So I think I'm reasonably qualified to discuss this. So let's backpedal and talk about Corey Taylor, the initial inspiration for this. Now, if you know Corey Taylor... He's the frontman, writer, singer for the band Slipknot, which is the mask band of nine members. You know, it's a little heavy for my taste, but I know Corey Taylor is a tremendously talented guy. I really like some of his solo stuff that I've heard, and I think he's got some other bands on the side, too. So he was talking about the fact that, you know, again, as I said, people may be surprised that the income for the Slipknot members is not at superstar level, even though the band themselves are perceived to be a superstar band. So first of all, I want to say I really commend him for being transparent about this because more people need to be. Um, and we'll touch on that in a second, but it's just the information is power. And the more information young people have in possibly choosing careers, uh, uh, music as a career, they can make a more informed and better decision if they're armed with more information. You know, so with the specific example of Slipknot, Corey goes on to basically say, and I'm I'm paraphrasing here, they basically live in an upper middle class lifestyle. You know, he's got a nice home, his children's education is paid for, he's got life insurance on his family, you know, he, he's doing okay. You know what I mean? And uh, that to me is great success. Um, but again... See, the music industry is an, uh, an industry based on image, much like uh, any celebrity-based or celebrity-tinged uh, job is. So, you know, a lot of the time, we perceive our heroes to be living this dream life. And some of them are, in terms of finances. I mean, you get to this the strata of success, that, you know, a lot of legendary bands are on. Yeah, they, they're multimillionaires many times over. And they've worked hard to earn it. That's neither here nor there. The, the very basis of this, I believe, comes from this. Musicians are taught to always put across and convey the image of success. Um, it pays, as a matter of fact, I had a manager tell us, it pays off dividends. Always appear successful. Don't discuss money, which we'll come back to you also, um, because there's so little of it in the beginning. Keep the dream alive. Always appear to be a rock star. Always appear to be, you know, um, and, the, and the, I mean, it's, it's a very simple reason why this takes place. And that's because people want to be around success. They want to be, uh, uh, you know, aligned with it. They want to support it. But, I mean, that goes to any industry. If you're a realtor, 
you want to come across as a successful realtor because people want to work with successful people. But yeah, we were always taught that. We were literally taught by management in the 80s and 90s, you know. Again, I'm paraphrasing, convey an image of success. Don't talk about limited finances because there's no money. People don't need to know that side. Just, you know, interviewers ask questions. Stress the positive and don't dwell on the negative. Now, well, the John just jaded eye can look back on that and say, yeah, well, of course, management didn't want us to talk about money because, you know, there's some tricky maneuvering in the card playing of the music industry. And we'll leave it at that. But, uh, yeah, you know, again, an image-based industry such as the music industry, you always want to convey an image of success. But the downside of that is that you're putting ac across this, you know, you hear, uh, you know, I can remember when I was a kid, you read about an article about ACDC in um, Circus or Hip Parader magazine, you know, as they pulled into the sold out concert in their limousine, you know, when you're a 15-year-old or 14-year-old, that's pretty impressive stuff, especially if you have dreams of the same caliber. But here's the thing, now, you know, you know, as you get older, that a lot of it's icing and very little cake. You know, um, what the magazine article doesn't tell you is that they were billed for those limousines by the promoter of the concert. It was taken off their guarantee off the top. Um, same with all the backstage. Jack Daniels and beer and food. And, and ultimately, the artist pays for everything. But why ruin people's dreams there? They want to think about Bon Scott backstage chugging a bottle of Jack Daniels before the show, which I'm sure did happen. Uh, but here's an interesting thing. Using ACDC as a perfect example, as we know, their career, the first half of it was with Bon Scott, and they were successful. And then when Bon Powell, they got Brian Johnson, put the back and black album, became really successful. So here's the difference. Pre Brian Johnson and Back in Black, I know from reading enough ACDC related biographies by their management and band members, they were doing well. They made a decent salary. They had money in the bank. Uh, the business was chugging along and building and progressing. But they were not the millionaires that we may think. Because as Bond Scott himself said, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. And as he also said, it ain't no fun waiting around to be a millionaire. So, you know, but if you would ask me as a music fan before I became knowledgeable of the industry, then is Brian Scott a millionaire? Of course he is. He's a singer for ACDC, touring around the world. And so here's where the plot thickens a little bit. Like if we can get into that and elaborate uh, just a little bit. People don't realize that in the music industry, most people that you work with and who work for you take a percentage of the gross money, okay? This is important to remember. So, you know, let's go back to those same magazine articles or today vlogs and blogs on the internet. So-and-so signed a $10 million record deal, okay? Well, for the sake of argument and for simple mathematics, let's go back to when I was a kid. Somebody signed, uh, you read in Circus Magazine, somebody signed a million dollar record deal. Now that sounds really impressive, especially in the 80s. And, to their credit, it is impressive because it's hard to get a record deal then and hard now, especially to get someone to put a million dollars in your business. But here's the thing. These figures that are fed to the public are also fed to the public with the intent of being, let's say inflated even, even when they're truthful, to be impressive, okay? So let me do a little quick math for you and show you what I'm talking about. Say a band signs a record deal for a million dollars, okay? Well, right off the top, management gets 20 to 25 percent, let's say 20 percent of the gross, okay? So that's two hundred thousand dollars gone off the million at 20 percent, leaving eight hundred thousand dollars. The band has to pay taxes on the entire million dollars, let's say 30 percent, and that's being lenient usually between 30 and 50% is withheld for taxes. But let's say 30%. So it's not 300,000, okay? So right now, money set aside for taxes and the management's commission taken off the gross, that's $500,000 of the million gone. Stop and think about that for a second, okay? Then, the business manager usually gets something like 5%, I think. So, you know, 
what is fifty thousand dollars off the top? Four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Legal fees and lawyers. That's a whole other vlog because I've had enough experience with lawyers in the music industry to talk for about four hours. Uh, but unfortunately, you need them to to navigate the uh, shark infested waters of the music industry. But let's just say hundred thousand dollars in legal fees. So now you're at three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Now, out of that advance, let's say the million dollar advance, just for the sake of argument, you have to pay for the recording of an album, which back in the 80s and 90s, even early 2000s, and sometimes today, is in the six figures. You were expected to, here's the money. Let's say a band spent 100,000, and that's being conservative, going into Sunset Sound in LA. Okay, $100,000 in recording costs, $250,000 left of the million. Uh, oh, and of course the producer gets a percentage. I think it's usually three, to f between three and 10 points to be a generous spread of the art, no, between three and five points, sorry, of the artist royalty rate. So if an artist negotiates a 60% royalty, let's say, and a 6% royalty goes to the producer. But the producer also gets an advance. So let's say $50,000. Well, now we're down to $200,000 that's left, okay? And again, I'm going on lowballing with these figures. Miscellaneous business expenses, but we won't even get into those. Let's just say there's $200,000 left after everything I just explained to you. And there's four guys in the band, four people in the band, $50,000 a person. Should they have to pay taxes on, of course, but the fact of the matter is, which sounds more impressive in an interview or talk to your family and friends? My band just signed a million dollar record deal or I just signed a $50,000 record deal. So you can see, and again, please remember, I'm being extremely generous with these figures. Usually I've heard cases of artists getting signed a million dollar plus deals and walking away with enough to buy new gear, maybe some clothes, that's it. So here's where my limited experience comes into play. As I said, I was a band called Buffalo Brothers. We signed directly with Attic Records, uh, which was the, the parent company, which was Universal, uh, which was MCA at the time. MCA became Universal. Universal bought them out. So I learned a great deal doing this, being the rep for the band with the label. Um, it's funny because around the same time, our friends in Sire and our friends in Blue Bones also signed record deals. Now, this is not begrudging them in any way, shape, or form, but I know during the business end, I learned that, you know, what these guys did was they signed with their management, who either had a label or a production deal, and then the management signed with, in both cases, A&M Records. So you're twice removed from the actual label, whereas we were direct signing to, like, only, t only telling you this for the basis of comparison because a production deal, 50% goes to whoever you sign with and 50% goes to the band. So take all those figures. And there's none of us were signing in close to a million dollar deal back then. Let's put it that way. So in pocket, I know for a fact that we and Buffalo Brothers all walked away with a little more cash in pocket from our record deal than our two contemporary bands. Whether, whether or not that's right or fair, it's not for me to say. I think both those bands should have had huge record deals. I think we should have had a huge record deal too. But I will break something down for you here. Attic is a medium-sized label in Canada. So our album, we had a sign for an album with, I think, four options. Now, options are, at the end of the date, the label can choose to pick up the option for your next record or drop you. And it's generally, if you know, if your album's done well, they'll pick up the option. And if it's done really well, then you've got a little negotiating power to try and get a little more money for the next album, a bigger advance, bigger royalty rate. So essentially, here's what it comes down to. And I know this for a fact. Attic sunk all told probably about $200,000, $250,000 into our record. Advances, radio tour support, videos, everything, marketing, and uh, which is small 
compared to like the million plus it usually takes to launch an American album around the same time in the 90s. But we were grateful for it. So with the options though, I could have technically told people we, we woo, <laughs> we had signed a million dollar deal or even more than a million dollar deal because if the options that have been picked up and that have sunk the same into every album, about $250,000, well, you add that times four, and that's, four, that's a million dollars, right? That's stretching the truth, but it's not a lie. And it comes full circle back to what the whole music industry thing is about, which image and success. Sorry, folks, but I'm not going to restart this whole thing over and again, so put up with me for a minute if you can. I'm on a roll. So I will tell you this. It's been enough time has passed, 30-something years, and I can be candid with you that... The largest check I walked out of Attic Records with, which was for $25,000. And that was to pay off the cost of the recording. No, pardon me. That was a check that got split uh, amongst the four band members. So we all walked away with a little over $5,000 in pocket. There were other checks for paying off the recording of the album, paying Dan Brabeck a producer's fee, Checks for tour support, video uh, budget. Uh, they gave us money to buy merchandise to go on tour. You know, t-shirts and hats and things like that. But the biggest individual check I walked away with was five thousand dollars. All of us did a little over five grand. And uh, to this day, I'm extremely grateful for it. I mean, somebody gave me money to play music. You know, you know, was it uh, same deal Pearl Jam got? No, or even Slipknot? Well, of course not. But I was grateful that it existed, you know, it was, it was a happy time. See, so look at someone like Corey Taylor. Okay, look at that. There's nine people in that band, first of all. Corey's one of the main writers, if I'm not mistaken. So the writers, that's where the money is. And they make more money than the rest of the band members, almost always. You know, John and Paul were far richer than George and Ringo. Um, so take that. And also the fact that nine people had to split the pie. And it was a very specialized stage show. They had a lot of technicians, because costumes, expensive costumes, expensive props, a lot of techs needed to run the show. So I can see why, despite the appearances of headlining all these festivals and whatnot, that they were considered to be this, these millionaire rock stars, when in reality the money was going out as fast as it came in. I'm sure. Huge overhead with a business like that. But once again, I really respect Corey Taylor for coming forward and being so honest about something that people are usually uh, discouraged from being honest about. So kudos to that guy, because people need, especially young people, you want to get into the music industry, you should be able to make an informed decision. And uh, anyway, yeah, this is, you know, it is possible to make a living playing music. I don't want to be discouraging to anyone. But you need to research and read up on how the business end works. It's called the music business for a reason. And, uh, you know, a funny thing, and I'll, I'll close with this. Here's, in my belief, why a lot of the big backlash came against bands during the whole Napster downloading thing, okay? Now, Metallica were successful almost from the get-go. Those guys have something like three of the largest selling back catalog albums, three of the top 10 largest selling back catalog albums in history. They've always sold a lot of records, a lot of merch, made a lot of money, but had a loyal fan base. So they worked hard for it. But um, if you look at it from the average person's perspective, they see Lars Ulrich on, on the news and Lars Orkel was completely in the right, by the way. I'm sorry. I don't, you know, we're not talking about opinion. We're talking about legalities. It's 100% right. People were taking what wasn't theirs. They were stealing it. Now, this is where it came across funny because people have little sympathy for someone they perceive as being a millionaire rock star, which he actually was. But then you've got younger uh, bands that may or not quite as successful who are portraying this image of limousines, sold out shows and blah, blah, blah. And people go, they've got more than enough money. 
Why do they care if I take the uh, music? They don't need it. So there's where we've come full circle, where the image in the music industry helped destroy the music industry. In closing, I have to say this. I don't have a clue as to how things work today. Uh, in, because I'm not actively involved anymore. Anything I do is pay to play. I just play for a living. I wouldn't be in a, a band from the ground up if you... There's an NFT in China, enough money. Well, there's money, but it's just not something I'm interested in at 55 years old. And the record industry's not interested in me. Let's be blunt. But it's interesting to see the changes. And one thing that hasn't changed is that it still takes a lot of money to launch a rock and roll band. And the other thing that hasn't changed, once again, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. Cheers, everybody.